Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're connecting from. My name is Kimana Fluetta Fulsha, and I'm the acting head of International Ideas Constitution Building Program. I welcome you all to this webinar on constitutionalizing institutions for a safer environment. It is really a tremendous pleasure to see such an enormous interest in this topic, but surely as well in listening to the fantastic panelists we're so lucky to have here today. I will shortly and very briefly introduce the panelists, but let me first just mention that this webinar is being recorded and that we also have simultaneous translation, interpretation, Spanish, English. If you want to access the interpretation, you can find a small globus icon on the bottom of your page that you can click on. If you're bilingual, there's nothing you need to do, of course, but if you're not, please choose the language of your preference on the list. And I will just very quickly repeat this in Spanish. Bienvenidos a nuestro webinario sobre constitucionalizar instituciones para promover un medio ambiente más seguro. Muy brevemente les comento que el webinario tendrá interpretación simultánea al español. Si quisieran acceder a la interpretación en la parte inferior de la pantalla pueden encontrar un pequeño icono en la forma de un globo terráqueo. Ahí deben seleccionar el idioma español para acceder a la interpretación. So now we're ready to start. We're very happy to have Dr. Kevin Casas Zamora, Secretary General of International IDEA, introducing this webinar. Kevin has been at the forefront of our institution's commitment to lead on the issue of climate change and democracy. The Secretary General will be followed by Dr. David Boyd, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, and author of critically important books, articles, and reports on the interconnection of environmental and constitutional law. And he will provide the opening remarks on the topic of constitutions and the environment. It is a great pleasure to have you with us today, Dr. Boyd. And then we have a fascinating panel with three key country experts on Kenya, on Brazil, on Hungary, who will reflect on the way different institutions have contributed to the enforcement of environmental rights, including Professor Patricia Camarin Bote, Director of the Law Division at the United Nations Environment Program, and also Associate Professor of Law at the University of Nairobi. Ms. Antonia, Maria Antonia Tigre, Director of Latin America for the Global Network for the Study of Human Rights and the Environment. And last but certainly not least, Professor Marcel Sabo, Judge of the Constitutional Court of Hungary and former Ombudsman for Future Generations. My brilliant colleague Adama Bebe will moderate the plenary discussion that will follow. Um, but without further ado, Secretary General, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Kimana. And good afternoon or good morning to, to you all. I am very happy to be here today and open this important and timely event on the role of constitutions in supporting the quest for and the right to a safe environment. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Boyd Professor Kameri Mbote, Ms. Tigre, and Professor Sabo for being with us today, as well as our colleagues at the Constitution Building Program for organizing this event. Uh, now, since I'm not sure how familiar you are with international idea and our work, let me start very briefly with, a, a, with an introduction. Uh, well, we are an intergovernmental organization with 33 uh, member states and an exclusive mandate to advance democracy worldwide. Uh, and we do this by developing comparative, evidence-based, policy-relevant knowledge for those engaged in political, electoral, or constitutional reform processes. We also support knowledge implementation on the ground by providing technical assistance through our regional and country offices, as well as through different kinds of projects in, in more than 60 countries around the world. We are one of the few intergovernmental organizations with a dedicated constitution building program. And I'm very proud to say that Ever since it was established in 2006, this program has been a key thought leader in, in this field. And just like the rest of international idea, the program has been 
uh, has played a significant role in supporting the constitution building community via knowledge generation, platforms, tools, and country level assistance. Uh, aside from constitution building, IDEA also works on issues related to electoral processes, parliaments, and political parties. And we have a separate work stream dedicated to assessing the performance of democracies around the world. Uh, in November, we will publish the third iteration of our Global State of Democracy report, which has become in some ways our flagship research product. It, since last year, we have also made climate change one of our new institutional priorities. As we see this as, a, as an existential challenge for the future of our planet and also for the future of democracy. For now, we have started to look closer at how climate change affects democracy and how democracy impacts climate change. And as you can imagine, this relation, uh, this relationship is, is, is both complex and comprehensive and surprisingly under-researched, by the way. It, this is why all our programs from elections to parliaments to constitution building uh, processes have started looking at climate change from their own thematic lens, aiming to develop knowledge and finding tangible solutions to equip democracies successfully to tackle the climate crisis. And this is where today's webinar on constitutions and climate change comes in. Through this webinar and, and other plan uh, future activities, our constitution building program is determined to support the discussion on how constitutions may help individuals and institutions to protect the environment and fight climate change. As, as we all know, the consequences of the climate crisis are no longer future scenarios, but daily news. We have all witnessed the devastating effects of floods, droughts, fires, and hurricanes in the past months alone. Entire regions of the earth are on the brink of becoming uninhabitable. And as a result, mass migration, inequalities, and conflict are exacerbated. All these challenges are befalling us at a time when democracy is already under immense pressure from growing authoritarianism and democratic backsliding, increased disinformation, and ever more acute polarization and inequalities, all of which have been turbocharged by the COVID-19 pandemic. While these are challenging times for democracy, we, we cannot af afford to, to, uh, to be inactive. Democracy is instrumental for mitigating climate change. Well over half of emissions of greenhouse gases come from democracies. But just as importantly, if democracies fail to act in the face of an existential uh, crisis, its own future is at risk. Uh, what use is a political system that is unable to protect the survival of humankind? We need to actively protect our climate and protect democracy. We must be able to, to, to walk and tweet at the same time, as it were. While there is no magic wand to allow democracies tackle effectively the climate crisis, constitutions can certainly embed robust institutional structures to address climate change. Fortunately, some countries have already pioneered institutional frameworks established to protect, monitor, and enforce environmental rights. The country examples presented uh, to be presented in today's webinar are cases in point. For example, Kenya's constitutionalized environment, environment and land court, Brazil's Ministerio Público Environmental Prosecutors, and Hungary's Ombudsman for Future Generations 
are all great innovations in legal and constitutional design, which can help protect the environment. And we need to build on these examples to see if comparable provisions can be established in other countries. We need to multiply the bright spots. Interestingly enough, a countries in transition, which bear the earliest brunt of climate change, are leading the way in constitutionalizing the protection of the environment. As I mentioned, constitutions might be only one piece of the puzzle in equipping democracies to deal with the intergenerational and transitional impacts of climate change, but they are a key piece of that puzzle. And this is because constitution building processes provide the opportunity to engage in social and political dialogue that coalesces on shared values. But they, they also empower democratic institutions to monitor, enforce, and protect those values. Constitutions can sustain the intrinsic value of a sustainable environment beyond the short-term calculus and machinations engendered by election cycles. If there is something we need when it comes to climate change is to stack decision-making incentives towards the long-term, which is something that constitutions uh, can help with. Moreover, constitutions can also guarantee procedural environmental rights, including rights to information, participation, and access to justice in matters related to the environment. I mean, let us just remember that in April of this year, following complaints by young climate activists, the, the German Constitutional Court decided that the country's Federal Climate Change Act was unconstitutional. Uh, because it was insufficient and had to be amended to actively protect the life and health of citizens from the risks posed by climate change. And, and this brings me to my last point. Constitutions can connect the duty to protect the environment with the rights of future generations, link the right to a healthy environment with indigenous rights, and entrench ecocentric constitutional innovations conceived to recognize the inherent rights of nature. It is for these reasons that we need to explore the full potential that constitutions have as the fundamental building blocks of inequality, a, their potential in addressing the challenges of climate change. As in so many, areas also in this field, constitutions can be powerful tools to shape political behavior, tools whose potential we must maximize. At International IDEA, we have placed climate change at the heart of our work. And we remain committed to strengthening democratic systems in the face of the existential crisis we currently face. But it is only through concerted actions, global partnerships, and the exchange of best practices to revitalize democracy, that we stand the chance to make a difference. If we are to preserve what is best in life, our planet and our democracies need our help urgently. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Secretary General, for your remarks and for really setting the stage for this discussion, reminding us of the importance of the link between democracy and the environment, and particularly the role of constitutions in, in protecting the environment and protecting us from climate change and setting some of the key questions that we hope to discuss throughout this webinar. So now it is my pleasure, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Boyd uh, to share his remarks with us. Dr. Boyd, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kamana. And I believe that this topic we're discussing today of environmental provisions and constitutions represents one of the most surprising, inspiring, and yet not well-known stories in the field of constitutional law. So I'm really deeply indebted to International IDEA for bringing us together, and more importantly, for the work that you're doing in this field, which is really terrific. You know, the seeds of my interest in this topic were planted by a Filipino lawyer named Tony Oposa Jr., 
who won a lawsuit before the Supreme Court of the Philippines way back in 1993, in which he argued that logging in old growth forests violated the constitutional rights of children to live in a healthy and balanced environment under Article 16 of the Filipino Constitution. That led me 15 years later uh, to do a PhD on constitutions, human rights, and the environment. And, you know, it's kind of funny, that journey which began prior to the development of the Google Constitute website, um, which enables you now today to search all of the world's constitutions with a single click of a mouse. Uh, I sat in the dusty basement of the law library at the University of British Columbia for weeks, reading 200 constitutions and typing the environmental provisions out on my laptop. And what I learned was really stunning, at least to a Canadian environmental lawyer because neither Canada nor the United States even mention the word environment in their constitutions. But these countries are the exception to the rule. Over 150 nations include environmental protection provisions in their constitutions, not including those who simply allocate jurisdiction to one level of government or the other. Over 150 constitutions have specific provisions requiring the government to protect and sustainably manage the environment. 100 nations include explicit in constitutional protection for the right to a healthy environment, a truly remarkable development that has occurred over the past four decades. Of course, different constitutions use a lot of different adjectives to describe this right, healthy, favorable, safe, clean, satisfactory, etc. But the general meaning is the same. And the widespread constitutional recognition of the right to a healthy environment is particularly surprising when you consider that none of the global human rights instruments even mention this right. It's not in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's not in either of the International Covenants or any other global human rights treaty. This right is found, however, in the 1972 Stockholm Declaration, a political pledge that emerged from the world's first eco-summit almost 50 years ago. And the first nations to include the right to a healthy environment in their constitutions were Portugal in 1976, Spain in 1978, and Peru in 1979. And that trend from the 1970s continues today with countries like Fiji, Cuba, and Tunisia recognizing this right in recent years. Environmental provisions really became common in constitutions during three regional waves of democratic reform, making that link that Kevin spoke about in his opening remarks. These were the decolonization of Africa, the demilitarization of Latin America, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The overwhelming majority of democratic constitutions in these regions today incorporate environmental provisions, including the right to a healthy environment. In addition to government duties and substantive environmental rights, a large number of constitutions also articulate individual duties to protect the environment and procedural environmental rights, access to information, public participation in decision-making, and of course, access to justice. Some countries have specific provisions in their constitutions. In African nations, there's a number that prohibit the import of hazardous waste. In Ecuador, the rights of nature are actually recognized. And uh, as Kevin alluded to, in recent years, we've seen a growing number of constitutions make references to climate change, this existential threat to humanity. And ironically, the, the majority of states where constitutions remain silent on environmental protection are small island developing states whose futures are at greatest risk from the global climate emergency. And I would say that this appears to be largely a matter of lack of capacity rather than opposition. And I would love to work together with these states, international idea and other partners to bring environmental provisions into the constitution of small island developing states. So that's really the, the global landscape of environmental provisions and constitutions. But I think it's also critical to ask the question, what difference does this make? And so I've looked in my research at three questions. First, do environmental provisions and constitutions contribute to changes in environmental laws? Second, do environmental provisions and constitutions lead to court decisions reflecting these provisions? And third, do, con do environmental provisions and constitutions lead to improved environmental performance, which is at the end of the day, probably the most important question. 
With respect to the first question, I found that in more than 80% of states, the inclusion of environmental provisions in constitutions was a catalyst for strengthening environmental legislation. And this makes sense in democracy democracies because when constitutional commitments are made, legislative changes are generally required to enable those commitments to be fulfilled. And in a number of countries, constitutional changes actually sparked the complete revision of environmental legislation focused on achieving and fulfilling the right to a healthy environment in countries including Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Portugal, France, and South Africa. In the small minority of states where no legislative changes were made, there were often other factors involved, such as civil war, extreme poverty, or weaknesses in the rule of law. With respect to the second question, I found evidence of court decisions citing the right to a healthy environment in over 50 countries, with the number of cases ranging from one, for example, in Malawi and the Seychelles, to hundreds of cases in countries like Brazil and Costa Rica. And these statistics are likely an underestimate due to the lack of online databases of court decisions in many countries at the time when the research was conducted. And I have to say, some of these cases are truly groundbreaking. One of my favorites being a decision of the Supreme Court of Argentina in a lawsuit brought by a handful of residents in the poorest neighborhood and poorest and most polluted community in Buenos Aires. These citizens allege that pervasive pollution in the Matanza Riachuelo watershed violated their constitutional right to a healthy environment. And the Supreme Court of Argentina agreed and ordered all three levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal, to take extensive actions to clean up the area and to build proper infrastructure for drinking water and wastewater treatment. Billions of dollars have been spent in cleaning up and restoring the Matanza Riachuelo River watershed uh, with substantial progress and work ongoing. With respect to the third question about environmental performance, uh, I'm a lawyer, not a statistician, but I did some basic analysis and found a strong positive correlation between environmental provisions in constitutions and improved environmental performance. So for example, states with constitutional environmental provisions reduced air pollution more quickly than states lacking those provisions, reduced greenhouse gas emissions more quickly, and performed better on a range of environmental metrics. And more sophisticated statistical analysis has been performed in recent years by economists who found a causal relationship between constitutional environmental protection and stronger environmental performance. So friends and colleagues, at the end of the day, constitutions serve a triple role in societies. They are the highest and strongest form of law. They represent a sacred covenant between governments and the governed in which each make solemn commitments to each other. And they express our deepest and most cherished values and aspirations. As a South African judge once wrote, constitutions are like a mirror of a nation's soul. To be sure, we face a profound implementation gap between the words on paper and actions on the ground. But I believe that the trend towards encourage, including environmental rights and responsibilities in constitutions is an encouraging and necessary step towards achieving a just and sustainable future for everyone. Thank you very much for your time today, and I look forward to hearing from Patricia, Maria, and Marcel. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Do Dr. Boyd, for, for that um, tour around the world about, about env environmental rights. You've given us a lot, of, a lot of issues to think about, and I'm sure that we'll, we'll consider them um, after this, this webinar. Um, now, as, as our, you know, both, uh, both Dr. Do Dr. Uh, Kevin Zamo Casa Zamora and Dr. Boyd spoke about the constitutions as being the most important legal documents uh, of, of, of any country. And at the same time, we have climate change and the environment that is posing the most important challenge humanity has ever faced. Now, the key is, is, is how much these constitutions have said in terms of guaranteeing substantive provisions. And I won't repeat what Dr. Boyd said, but what we are gathered today to discuss most importantly is about the institutions. Uh, what kind of institutions have constitutions around the world established to make sure that the promises, the substantive guarantees of protecting the environment are actually given life? Uh, Dr. Boyd gave, gave us some statistics and what we wanna hear, and we have um, three extremely well-qualified professionals with us. We want to hear from them um, um, how the institutions have performed. 
First, um, from Kenya, um, Prof Professor Kamer Mboti, um, can you please tell us what the origin of the land and, and environmental tribunals, tribunals are? Um, what did the constitution do to them, you know, to, to enhancing their status, to enhancing their relevance? Um, and, and most importantly, um, have they made a difference? Have these institutions made a difference? I mean, counterfactuals are always difficult, um, but can you imagine, or could you imagine the, these institutions making any difference or as much difference as they have made had it not been for, for the constitutional, uh, constitutional change? And most importantly, what are the lessons? What can we learn from the experience of uh, these, these tribunals from Kenya? Um, uh, and, and we'll start with these key questions and then proceed to Brazil and then to, to Hungary. Thank you very much. And Professor Kamer Mbote, you have the floor. You, Professor, you are still on mute. Professor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to appreciate IDEA for having put this uh, discussion together and also for giving me an opportunity to speak about uh, our Environment and Land Court. And uh, basically, I think uh, the, the presentation by uh, Dr. Boyd is very critical because it puts out where the institutionalization of um, of uh, institutions like um, the Environment and Land Court start. And uh, I think you couldn't have constitutionalized institutions without provisions in the constitution on the environment and related uh, substantive and procedural rights. The right to a healthy environment, local standard, access to justice, ETC. Uh, in Kenya, uh, the Environment and Land Court was created in 2010. In the 2010 Constitution of Kenya, we have the establishment of a specialized court, which is uh, the Environment and Land Court uh, with a jurisdiction like that of the High Court. Previously, normal courts determined environmental matters. And actually, we had a checkered history because um, of the lack of understanding of the issues. Also, because before the co that constitution, we didn't have uh, an explicit provision in the constitution of a right to a healthy environment. Even though it was provided for in the Environment and Man Management and Coordination Act, people would always say that you couldn't take it to the level of the constitution. And so people depended a lot on the right to life to bring in the right to a healthy environment. So with the 2010 constitution, we now not only have the recognition of the right to a healthy environment, but also an institutional framework for putting that right into a realization. And uh, the, the specialization of this court is seen actually as a very important reform initiative uh, and also has helped our judicial system develop in the area of enhanced access to justice. Uh, the, the Environment and Land Court is not the only specialized court. We have two specialized courts. The other one is on uh, Employment and Labor Relations Court. But with regard to the one on Environment and Land, it was very clear that uh, it would determine disputes relating to the environment use and occupation of entitled to land, which are very critical issues in Kenya and people are always dealing with this. There, there is an Environment uh, and Land uh, Court Act, which elaborated further the jurisdiction and functions of this court. And actually more refinement has been seen through jurisprudence. Uh, within the judiciary, if you're looking at the hierarchy, uh, the Environment and Land Court would be among the superior courts because we have the subordinate courts, which are magistrates courts, and then superior courts, which are High Court, Court of Appeal, and Supreme Court. And uh, the Environment and Land Court has the same uh, status as that of the High Court. 
it, it, it is different. And uh, the question, of course, is what has this meant for the court establishment? Uh, do we have a separate court? What does it mean for judges? Do we have the same judges as those that go to the high court? Or do we uh, appoint judges with special qualifications? I think you've asked me the question on why do we have specialized courts? And I think I start by quoting Judge Brian Preston, the chief judge of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court. Uh, he was very instrumental in the establishment of the Kenya Environment and Land Court. And he was of the view that a court with special expertise in environmental matters is best placed to play the role of uh, promoting sustainable and ecological development. And uh, of course, specialized court help uh, bring more effective access to justice. And also they help because uh, they remove specialized issues from the more mundane questions and uh, may actually help in this way to reduce uh, backlog. I think uh, specialized courts uh, recognize the fact that legal issues, especially where you're dealing with the environment, are complex. They are inter, multi or transdisciplinary. And therefore, having a specialized court helps to focus on uh, specific questions. Specialized court also give uh, a home for judges with special knowledge and expertise in environmental law. And uh, they, this facilitates the development of stronger jurisprudence that transcends legalistic approaches uh, to law. Uh, the, uh, it also streamlines procedures and operations. I think before we had the Environment and Land Court, what would happen is that if an environmental matter was put before court, it would be dismissed at technicality level. But now there are streamlined processes and procedures which helps to uh, dispose the matters more efficiently and also more effectively. Uh, they also en ensure uniformity of court decisions, uh, bringing about, of course, rule of law, um, aims of predictability, consistency, also higher uh, quality of decisions. And we have uh, confidence of uh, litigants. Um, the, the, the fact that they have special and distinctive nature uh, helps judges concentrate on particular issues. And I think here, one of the things that we have learned is the importance of training of judges, uh, because even though they would know uh, issues of environment and land, there are new issues coming up all the time. And like I said earlier, for our court, refinement of the jurisdictional question has happened a lot through case law. Like we had one case where a bench uh, which had brought together judges of the Environment Court and uh, ordinary judges of the Court of uh, High Court actually, making a decision on uh, an, uh, whether a person uh, should be released having been, um, having been uh, um, convicted of murder. And uh, the court up to the Supreme Court held that the fact that the bench included judges of the Environment and Land Court meant that it was incompetent and therefore the matter needed to go back to being hard. So in essence, uh, implementing the specialization model calls for being thoughtful about how that bench interacts with others. What are the challenges we, we faced? At the beginning, I think we didn't have enough judges. And this is because specialized courts are courts of first instance. So they have very high caseload. And at the beginning, we had a purist uh, implementation of this uh, environment and land court excluding lower courts from hearing environmental matters. This was challenged in court and now subordinate courts do hear um, environmental matters and they come to the environment and land court on appeal. The other challenge is that some of the judges 
were not uh, specialized, especially on environment, because whilst land law is a core course for law study, environmental law is not a core course and has not always been taught in uh, schools. Another implementation challenge was the institutional design. What kind of court? I think because we already had a high court, there was the question of whether we needed just a bench or an ad hoc uh, bench, or you could actually mix uh, the judges. And uh, this, uh, again, was refined through, uh, through case law when it was decided that it is uh, important to have environment and land court judges concentrate on environment and land court matters. The issue of jurisdiction is also a big uh, issue because it being environment and land, the question is what exactly is an environment and land case? Because many cases tend to have uh, these issues, whether they are commercial, they may be family or civil cases. And uh, what has uh, happened over the years is that the court has uh, made, a, the, the, the courts have made a decision that you look at uh, what is the principal thing that took the person to court. So even if the matter has uh, a commercial transaction in a land issue, you don't just look at the issues that arise, you look at what it is that the person that went to court was seeking. And, and this has really helped. In fact, uh, what uh, the Supreme Court of Kenya has held is that the Environment and, court, uh, and Land Court is a special cadre of court with soi generis jurisdiction. So the, this issue of mixing benches or having them decide on manner of uh, cases is not allowed. So what are the key achievements? I think we now have about 52 judges in 33 of 47 counties, rising from 14 in 12 counties in 2012. We are actually seeing very robust jurisprudence on EIA, uh, relationship between the National Environment Management Authority and lead environmental agencies. And even the cases that I'm talking about where you have clarification of jurisdiction of the Environment and Land Court vis-a-vis uh, -vis the High Court, you see very good uh, jurisprudence on the predominant purpose test. What is it that took the litigant to court in the first instance? And now I think it is established that all environmental matters, uh, the, the, all appeals on environmental matters go to the Environment and Land Court, even if they present as a judicial review, they actually have to go to uh, the Environment and Land Court. And, and actually we see a court now that is very strong and uh, which is making pronouncements on very many critical issues. So in terms of what we have learned and uh, looking forward, uh, the Environment and Land Court in Kenya demonstrates that specialized courts set apart towards sustainable environmental management. I think what Dr. Boyd was saying about uh, having better laws or having uh, better management of the environment, I think for us, if we didn't have a robust environment and land court, the uh, proscription of single-use plastics may not have happened in the way that it did. Then implementing specialized court takes time and needs to carry other institutions. Uh, here it needs to carry the ordinary courts. In Kenya, we have a plural legal system. So we do have uh, customary traditional institutions that resolve disputes. And these need to be carried along so that uh, all of them work towards uh, sustainable and environmental management. I think the other thing that needs to be thought about finally is career progression of judges in specialized courts. Because if you have specialization at the environment and land court, which is at the high court level, then you may actually have a very robust jurisprudence at that level, but it is not the same when you go to the court of appeal or to the uh, Supreme Court. So if we want to make specialization stick along the continuum of access to justice, career progression 
of judges of specialized courts needs to be thought about. I thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Professor. Very, very important. I think the, the, the fact that you point out the interdisciplinary nature uh, of, of the issues that environment raises and the interdisciplinary expertise that it requires uh, is very, uh, very important. And you spoke about, I think, uh, you know, the, the importance also of ensuring compliance with environmental impact assessments. Uh, and I think the, the case you mentioned about the proscription of single-use single use plastic bugs, uh, maybe hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss uh, in, in a bit more detail uh, later. Uh, but thank you very much for, for sharing Ken Kenya's experience. Uh, to our participants, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A if they are substantive uh, for the panelists. The chat function is principally for, for technical issues. Um, now, thank you again, Professor. And now uh, Kenya has, has unique specialized courts and Brazil has established unique public defending uh, organs. They call them pu the public prosecutors. Maybe my Portuguese is very bad. Um, so we, we have Maria Ant Antonia Tigre to tell us a little bit about the origins, how, wh what, what led to their constitution, the constitutionalization of uh, these bodies? Have they delivered? Um, you know, how, how, have, have they, how, how have they performed? And most importantly, what are the lessons uh, for, for the rest of the world? You have the floor and 15 minutes, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and talk a little bit about Brazil's experience uh, with the Ministerio Público, or just call it MP, and explain a little bit the difference. Uh, it's not a, exactly a public prosecutor, but it's similar to, to that. So it's a mix of a couple of different things that I'll talk about. Um, so I'll start by just uh, explaining briefly how the right to a healthy environment is uh, like David mentioned, in the Brazilian constitution, it's a fundamental right. Uh, in, so along other traditional human rights. So Article 225 of the Brazilian constitution provides that all have the right to an ecologically balanced environment, which is an asset of common use and essential to a healthy quality of life. And both the government and the community shall have the duty to defend and preserve it for present and future generations. So there's the right and then there's the duty, right? The, the duty to defend it. And so public authorities have a legal obligation to protect the environment and uh, preserve it for present and future generations. So the Ministerio Público, so the MP is a powerful example and uh, effective, a very effective monitoring and enforcement body uh, that was established in the Brazilian constitution. So in 1988, when the constitution was adopted. So the constitution provides MP with broad powers to monitor and enforce violations of, among other things, constitutional rights. So the constitution established MP is a permanent institution that's essential to the jurisdictional function of the state and uh, that is functionally independent from, um, from the three branches of government, right? So it's often referred to as the fourth branch and has the duty to defend the rule of law, the democratic regime and social and individual interests. Um, as a permanent institution guaranteed by the constitution, the prosecutor's main job is to uphold justice and the rule of law. And due to this constitutional mandate, uh, the public prosecutor's office is globally recognized as a sui generis institution. So like I mentioned, it's a sort of a mixed between a couple of different things and they have complete financial and political autonomy, which is very significant for the work that they do. Uh, so the public prosecutor's office is a body of public prosecutors at the federal and state level. It operates, like I said, independently from the three branches of government has often been referred to as the fourth branch. So <coughs> I apologize, I have a really bad cold, so hopefully it won't be too horrible for me to speak. <coughs> so Article uh, 129 of the Constitution. <coughs> I'm sorry. Take your time. <laughs> right, so I'll, I'll start. I'll try to speak even slower. <laughs> so that we can get to it. Uh, so it outlines the functions of the MP to institute civil investigation and public civil suits to protect uh, public and social property and the environment specifically, as well as other diffusing collective interests. And because of this mandate, 
they have been uh, incredibly active in the area of, of environmental protection, including in terms of enforcement and uh, policy development as well. So this uh, prerogative of promoting unconstitutionality claims and this almost unlimited jurisdictional scope in the defense of rights um, has made the MP responsible for bringing very bold uh, cases to Brazilian courts. And I'll talk a little bit about those uh, towards the end of my presentation. So, but just to give you an example, in the state of Sao Paulo alone, the MP has brought over 4,000 environmental cases. Uh, and in recent years, the MP has also used uh, the threat, the only the threat of threat of a prosecution as a means to negotiate settlement agreements with polluters, which are referred to as conduct adjustment agreements. So, sort of the, the extrajudicial role that it has as well. So, I'll also talk a little bit about sort of these two different uh, roles that they have, and these agreements allow them to avoid the high costs and delays and uncertainty of the judicial system. So. There's a traditional role that they have of bringing criminal charges, trying criminal cases, and eventually conducting criminal investigations, which is sort of similar to what a, a classic prosecutor um, does in, in other countries. But they can also bring action against private individuals, commercial enterprises, as commercial enterprises, the union, state, federal district, and municipal government in defense of minorities, the environment, and uh, consumers as well, and the civil society in general. And they also have mandates to control public administration and protect the rights of citizens, um, which are functions that usually in other countries fall upon different institutions, such as the Nombudsman or a Defensor del Pueblo. So, uh, you know, the, this the, the, this important role that the public prosecutors uh, have in protecting the public interest in fundamental rights is a, a constitutional guarantee. So it's uh, in addition to the provisions of the constitution to talk about the MP and environmental protection, there's a specific provision that makes that role an immutable clause within the constitution. So that also, you know, it's another, it's another guarantee of the work that they do. Um, so the constitution also established some of the institutional principles. So there's, uh, there's the unity of the MP as in it's one body, the indiv indivisibility of it as in one prosecutor can substitute the other, but there's also functional independent. Um, so one cannot arbitrarily replace the other. And this functional independence uh, aspect guarantees ample freedom to exercise their role according to existing legal norms and conviction. And um, as the society's pri primary guardian, the mandates of the MP include the control of policies on, on health rights, environmental rights, elections. So a, a, a bunch of uh, different areas uh, on fundamental rights that are essential to, to, to their role. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about now about in terms of environmental protection, the extrajudicial role that I mentioned briefly here. So um, usually an extrajudicial solution is more effective because courts are slow and have little, uh, sometimes little knowledge about the particular aspects of the environment when, uh, when they're not environmental courts. Um, it's harder to produce proof. So there are lots of challenges to actually, you know, getting to uh, an effective solution towards uh, like using the courts. So there's this, um, the, the MP can then conduct investigations, which allow them to have more conviction about the facts that were brought to their knowledge as violating collective interests or rights. And they have several administrative instruments that are covered upon them that allows for negotiation and ensuring full consideration of all the aspects involved, such as time, techniques, and costs and uh, increased rate of implementation of decisions. So it enables uh, a change of conduct which sometimes is not necessarily illegal, but that's ineffective for environmental protection. So using this threat of a, of a, a prosecution can actually lead to sort of that adjustment of conduct from, from companies and from uh, bodies of the government itself. So uh, a solution is only adopted after several meetings with pu public authorities, scientific communities, and civil society, and ensure, ensuring this consent, uh, consent consensual decisions that have more 
legitimacy. And they can also call for public hearings to mediate different interests, uh, ensuring public participation, which also you know, increases the, the degree of legitimacy. And all of the, these mechanisms really ensure that MP can fulfill this constitutional mandate that they have of protecting the fundamental rights, such as the right to a healthy environment. Um, but then if that solution, if an extrajudicial solution is not possible, they can also, they also have this role in, in public interest litigation. So uh, the investigations that they make can eventually lead to a public civil action if there's no extrajudicial solution. And um, a study from the early 2000s has shown that the MP is responsible for around 90% of environmental public civil action. So it's a very significant number. I think the scenario has likely changed a bit as NGOs have been more active in courts recently, but it still represents the vast majority. And there are actually some critics that have argued that one of the unintended consequences of, the, of this role of the MP lies in the lack of influence of civil society organizations in the judicial and political sphere. But from what I see of recent cases, especially in climate litigation, is that there are actually a lot more involvement from civil society organizations and political parties as well, starting new cases. So I think it has, um, you know, has obviously a very important effect in, in, in introducing that aspect of public, uh, of, uh, public interest litigation and in, in now, which is now broadening to other actors as well. So it's one of the most uh, useful mechanisms for the protection of collective rights, such as the right to a healthy environment. And uh, the way that it works nowadays that um, the MP really responds to the non-enforcement problem of Brazilian environmental law, which is that Brazilian, Brazil has a very strong constitution in terms of environmental rights and um, very strong environmental laws, very, you know, there's a, a significant framework of environmental laws in Brazil, but which are very strong on the books, but there's they're weak in practice. So the Brazilian constitution protection of the environment uh, and, and, and the corresponding environmental laws have really lacked uh, compliance generally. So this prosecutorial enforcement has reshaped environmental protection by providing a new type of environmental enforcement. And they become very active in environmental protection, enforcing environmental laws against both public and private actors. And uh, I think one of the significant ways in which this role has increased recently is through uh, strategic planning to ensure that the priorities are met. Because they obviously receive um, complaints about several issues that are uh, going on around the country, which is you know, a huge country, and it's uh, sometimes a little hard to ensure that the priorities are met. So um, I wanted to mention you know, this is strategic planning through the example of a task force that was created in 2018 uh, on the defense of environmental public policies. There are a priority for the federal government and for the two environmental, federal environmental agencies in Brazil. And it's called the uh, Amazonia Task Force. So it's specifically uh, pr protecting the Amazon rainforest and, you know, uniting the, because the Amazon rainforest, I don't know if you know this, but even within Brazil, it's spread across different Brazilian states. So sometimes there wasn't a lot of communication between the MPs in, in each of those regions, because we have the federal MP and then the state MP. So uh, this task force was created exactly to, so that they could talk and, uh, you know, have joint uh, actions to actually ensure that the priorities are met and the biggest polluters were, you know, brought to justice. So they, uh, over the, the over, since 2018, uh, the, this task force has called for the payment of over 3 billion uh, reais from environmental offenders to guarantee the recovery of um, uh, 151,000 hectares of, of the legal Amazon. So this concentrates over 500 investigations in 18 criminal cases that were initiated and has allowed uh, a joint action by those working in Amazonia and targeting criminal activities related to deforestation in the hotspots 
in Amazonia and targeting public policies related to enforcement of policies or the lack of, of enforcement of those policies, such as zoning and the invasion of indigenous territories and emergency measures that reduced enforcement of policies during the pandemic. Um, and I think one of the most important issues was actually that it was targeting also corruption by public body, bodies that have facilitated illegal deforestation. Um, so, no, that's the, the sort of the last example that I wanted to give in terms of the, the role of the MP, and I'm happy to you know, answer any questions that you may have. Thank, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, very, very interesting. And I think one of the, the key points that I picked up is how uh, they have a lot of flexibility, not just to conduct investigations, but also to use the trait of prosecution uh, to bring about public government as well as corporate change of policy and, and behavior. I think, you know, in Kenya, we saw that it's more, you know, it's a court, so it, it needs somebody to, to, uh, to keep, you know, to start, to start the machinery, to keep things in motion. But in, in, in Brazil, it's actually the opposite. They are the ones that actively initiate uh, the process. So, so very, quite, quite an interesting contrast. And I understand that in Kenya, there are other entities that are not in the constitution that perhaps also have investigative roles. Um, so I think it would be useful to see whether there are multiple institutions or single institutions uh, leading, leading the ways. But thank you, thank you very much. Um, and we now have uh, Professor Marcel Sabo from, from Hungary. Um, you know, Kenya has the courts, um, Brazil sort of has a, a pro, you know, entities that, uh, that act like public prosecutors. And Hungary has experience with a genuinely forced branch institution um, called the, and, and he will tell us the details, but the, the, the Commission for G G Future Generations. And that commission has undergone several reforms since it was, since it was established. And we have uh, one of the first um, commissioners of that, that entity to speak with us. Uh, so Professor Zabo, tell us what happened. How was it that it, it got expression in the constitution? Um, and again, same question, how has it performed? Uh, and, and crucially, what are the key lessons for the rest of the world? Thank you very much. Professor, you are still- uh, First, we need to have the voice. Uh, thank you very much for the floor. Uh, thank you very much for the possibility to speak about the Hungarian experiences uh, in relation to in institutions related to the protection of future generations. And this is notably the institution of the Ombudsman for Future Generations. And as I understand, one of the underlying concepts of this uh, gathering is to have the process of Chile to have uh, its, uh, consti its, its constitution reshaped. And uh, first of all, I checked whether Chile has currently an, an ombudsman type institution so that we can uh, have uh, something uh, in, in common to, to say and to, and to contribute. But uh, as, as far as I see in, uh, in South America, uh, currently it is Chile, uh, the, the country, Chile is the country which is currently missing the institution of ombudsman. But there is an institution called the National Institute for Human Rights uh, and uh, the Transparency Council that have certain rights to, uh, to highlight uh, uh, the legislation and the jurisdiction that, uh, that certain issues are not going uh, in line as it should be uh, in relation to human rights. Uh, the institution of the Ombudsman is generally a, a, a spokesperson who is speaking on behalf of the public and having certain rights to issue reports, to step in into individual cases and uh, to mediate uh, in order that a solution for a, a citizen whose rights are infringed to be solved directly. That's, that's the, 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 the normal concept of the Ombudsman, as you know very well. So it is a very interesting and specific task how to represent future generations. Uh, there is a long-standing theoretical debate whether there is one person who could stand for uh, future generations. How, what could it say and in, in which matters could it interfere? As we know that, in fact, probably all aspects of our current decision-making is having an impact on future generations. So immediately the big question is arising, uh, how can some person come out and say, I am capable 
uh, and competent to, to say what future generations are needed, uh, let alone the discussion on pot potential uh, conflict between the interests of future generations and generations uh, even later in the further uh, in the in the row. So can can I represent future generations? Uh, uh, do I represent my grandchildren's generations and my grandchildren, my grandchildren or, or nation's grandchildren's generations can have rights uh, or interests which could be uh, in sharp uh, controversy with interest in subsequent further generations? Well, in in, in practice, I think uh, all this type of discu all discussion marks. Uh, the institution of the Ombudsman for Future Generations, as it is regulated in the Hungarian Constitution now, uh, is a very success, successful institution. And what it is doing uh, in practice and how it can uh, represent future generations in practice, it is very much intertwined with a section of the Hungarian Constitution, which I actually put on the chat board. Uh, and that is Article P of the Hungarian uh, Constitution. Uh, that says that all natural resources, in particular arable land, forest, and the reserves of water, biodiversity, in particular uh, native plant and animal species, and culture artifacts shall form the common heritage of the nation. It shall be the obligation of state and everyone to protect and to maintain them and to preserve them for future generations. So there's a constitutional lag uh, which is very important. I will uh, return to this very, very quickly. Uh, that, that prescribes for the preservation of natural resources, the basic living conditions for future generations. And if I can sum up my work as an Ombudsman for Future Generations very briefly, uh, in theory, an Ombudsman for Future Generations could cry out for a better education for kids, so for a better future, a better social system, uh, not to have loans uh, uh, overburying uh, interests of future generations, but you cannot, as a single person, act as a fourth branch of government alone and trying to say what would be good for future generations. So although the Hungarian constitution uh, mentions the um, and prescribes for the institution of the Ombudsman for Future Generations as part of the institution of the General Ombudsman for Human Rights, but with an independent mandate. Uh, the Ombudsman for Future Generations mainly focuses on, uh, on, on measures, legislation, uh, and all sorts of other acts uh, that are endangering the natural resources, the basic living conditions of future generations uh, uh, of our country citizens. So that, that, that is what I think in a nutshell is the key function. And how it functions? Uh, it is functioning uh, uh, in, as, a, as a mediator person. Of course, there's a significant portion of the society who do care for the future generation's interest. And it can be, uh, the ombudsperson can be a, a middleman between that section of the society and the political power. Uh, somebody who can who can impersonate needs cries uh, representing the interests of future generations. Uh, the other very important helping factor is science. It's very often that the government wants to do something uh, which is uh, beneficial in the short term, but could be terribly damage damaging on the long run. And as we know that the current economical thinking and measurement doesn't really help. Uh, with uh, uh, minimizing the long-term damage impact uh, in the cost analysis of a current, currently built project. So, and, and science is also problematic because uh, as, we, as we know, science is never entirely black and white. Uh, it, can, it can only express itself in, in hypothesis and uh, with uh, probabilities and uh, politicians need uh, black and white uh, uh, clear yes and no answers. And actually the Ombudsperson for Future Generations, back, back by the big probability of, uh, of a bad event in the distant future, uh, underlined by the science, can be the person 
impersonating that danger uh, and showing that danger to the society and crying out in, in his own personal capacity uh, to, the, uh, to the country. Uh, if there is a, just one single object, a very, very, very valuable 2,000 years old tree uh, that is planned to be cut off, uh, an ombuds person can chain himself to the tree and can impersonate himself trying to uh, step in and uh, uh, the media coverage can be very useful and has been useful in a, in a, in, in a very significant amount of times to prevent actions uh, uh, which were nearly to be taken by the government. But uh, the, ombudsperson for, the Ombudsman for Future Generations has a legal piece as well. Uh, I, as an ombudsperson, as an ombudsman for future generations, I, I had the right to go into the parliament and while a piece of legislation was negotiated in the parliament, uh, I can enter into any commission and raise my voice that it is not going to be good. It is going to be against the interest of future generations. And although uh, my, in my own personal capacity as ombudsman for future generations, I couldn't turn uh, myself to the Constitutional Court, but I could turn to the head of the office, uh, the General Ombudsman for Future Generations, and look, uh, as a sociological thing, one Ombudsman will not turn down the other Ombudsman. So the General Ombudsman always said, yes, let's try to do it. Let's try, let's go ahead and uh, uh, try to uh, petition the Constitutional Court and ask for an annulment uh, of uh, a piece of legislation uh, which is damaging the interests of future generations. And uh, now I am in the seat of uh, a justice of the Constitutional Court. And recently, the current Ombudsman for Future Generations, via the General Ombudsman for Future Generations, uh, the General Ombudsman for Future Generations, uh, the General Ombudsman for, for Human Rights, was petitioning the Constitutional Court. And we annulled a very significant portion of the uh, Hungarian forest management uh, legislation, uh, which was changed recently and which was changed in a very negative dimension, uh, uh, endangering the interests of future generations. So that's a good institution because it has peace, it can create publicity, and uh, what is what I think is why it is a very good legal solution in the Hungarian constitution is that uh, the general institution of Ombudsperson for Human Rights is such a, such a widely known and recognized institution. And lobbying for a, a specific deputy only dealing with uh, the interest of future generations, I think it is something uh, which is in all times easy or could be easier probably uh, to achieve than finding new, in, find, to find out an entirely new and independent institution. But if in Chile you are considering uh, uh, the introduction of the institution of an ombudsman, please consider at least a deputy for future generations. And one very important uh, uh, correlation between the work of, uh, of the general ombudsman and his deputy uh, working for future generations is an ombudsman, uh, the general ombudsman for human rights can only act when a human rights violation has already occurred. While, uh, it's, uh, while, the, while it's, de it's, yet it's deputy, the Ombudsman for Future Generations can cry out in precautionary principle matters when there is only a very distinct probability for a harm, uh, when the Ombudsman, the general Ombudsman, couldn't have the possibility to act. An Ombudsman for Future Generations with this nice title can, only, can already cry out and can only, already demand that uh, an appropriate uh, action uh, should be taken. Uh, so that is the main concept of the Ombudsman for Future Generations in Hungary, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Sabo. Um, if I, I think, you know, I picked up a few things. First, that the the uh, future the ombudsman for future generations actually wears several hats one is is to translating popular ideas popular 
demands for, for better policies into, into decision makers. And he also talked about how it can engage um, policymakers as they draft policies, as they take measures. And as necessary, uh, you said, through the head of the Ombudsman for Human Rights to approach the Constitutional Court, including the recent case uh, that, that you spoke about. So it, it, it wears several hats. And, and, I, and, and also you said that it's an important entity that has popularity and that has made, that has made difference uh, over, over the years. Um, now, th thank you very much again. Uh, so we've heard about the, the three country cases now. Um, and I have, uh, it's, you know, we, we can open it for questions. And I see that there's already a few questions out there. Uh, so what I'll try and do is uh, read some of them and invite uh, the most appropriate person to speak on, on, on those issues. First question from a, a PhD student from the University of Edinburgh. Um, they are asking, particularly for Professor Kamerin Bote about the courts, and she's asking about the qualifications. Uh, how are the judges selected? How are they trained? Um, considering, as you say, the inter interdisciplinary needs of, of the job. Uh, Professor uh, Kameri, uh, can, you, can you quickly address that? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. The uh, judges are lawyers, but they are required to have some experience in environment and land matters. Uh, so there is no requirement that uh, people would have taken a master's course, though usually people, uh, the judges would have taken those uh, postgraduate courses, but it is not a requirement in the constitution to be a judge. So what they'll be looking at is if you've been a judge, what matters have you been deciding? If you're not a judge, what exposure do you have to land and environment matters? Thank you very much. I hope that is helpful. And uh, you can always look for Professor Kamerin Bote's address and, and maybe reach out to, to, to her as well. She's, she's obviously very busy and she's soon taking up a new position as director of the UN Environmental Program, uh, the legal office, uh, but I'm sure she'll, she'll make the time. A uh, question from a Senegalese colleague, um, Us Usmane Mane. Um, he asked, it's, it's an enduring question about the challenge of the, the divide between aspiration, constitutional guarantees, and realities, implementation. Um, and, you know, we've heard about Brazil and, and Professor, Professor Zabo also spoke, spoke about Hungary. Um, but if you can tell us one or two lessons, why, uh, why, you know, you've said that the institutions in Brazil and Hungary work. And what is the trick? Uh, what can be done? And in, in particular... Uh, did the constitutionalization of these institutions help? Um, I'll start with Professor, Professor Sabo and then I'll, I'll go to Maria. Absolutely. I think uh, the constitutional uh, uh, standing, uh, as, uh, as we have heard uh, with uh, uh, Professor David Boyd, he, he was excellent in highlighting uh, how, in, in how and in which ways it was uh, perfectly helping the, the, the constitutional standing of environmental legislation, uh, a higher profile in the court proceedings in, and also in political decision making. Uh, but I believe that uh, the international obligations of states, such as, for example, being part of the Biodi Biodiversity Convention, which is nearly universal, uh, or, uh, or, or, or also uh, the Kyoto Protocol for uh, for the climate issues, I think these can these can be cornerstones uh, that could be used by national judges. And I, I, I see in Europe also where even even in European countries sometimes uh, necessary le legal tools from the domestic legislations do not exist. Uh, they can grab it from from the from the international level. I think uh, the higher profile it may have. The people may tend to believe more that it has a, they have an obligation to do something. No, th th thank you very much. Essentially, the key message is that if it is in the constitution, um, at least actors like the judiciary, which whenever they have the willingness, they will be able to make their mark. So it, it matters that they are in the constitution. Uh, it's one predictor, one indicator that, uh, that they could perhaps be more, more implementation. Maria, do you want to add from, from Brazil's experience? He's asking, you know, you have rights, you have institutions, but they don't, they don't, they, they don't do their jobs. Um, what, 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 is, what is right? What is wrong in, in, in Brazil? 
I think uh, one of the main benefits of having the Ministerio Público in Brazil is the, the function of independence. And uh, uh, I think that definitely helps because they can call on uh, all the branches of government and on uh, on private, private parties as well to actually um, do what the, the constitution says about environmental protection and ensuring that the right to a healthy environment and that the duty to protect the environment are preserved. So that um, that independence comes in several different ways, but I think importantly, the, um, the financial independence is also key here because they can also invest in their own training and um, learn about new theories and come up with bold new cases and legal theories that um, are able to enforce the existing law. So for example, there was just a recent case that they brought, which was very groundbreaking because they um, they're, they're, uh, brought an action against a, a cattle rancher. So a big cattle rancher who owns you know, very, a very large area uh, and have asked for climate damages. So it's the first time that they ask for climate damages for compensation of climate damages about, because of all the illegal deforestation that he has caused. So I think that independence is essential in, in bringing those cases. Th thank you very much. So constitutional status, but also independence is, is, is central. But I think also one of the points that Professor Sabo spoke about is popularity. The ability of these institutions to anchor themselves and, and build popular constituencies, which obviously enhance their, their, their voice. And I th thank you very much. Adam, you muted yourself. Can, can you hear me now? Um, so the, 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 the other question from Mariano Machado, I think it's from, uh, from, from Chile. Um, it is more about substance, and I, I don't know if, uh, if uh, Dr. Boyd is still with us and would be happy to take. I, I understand, you know, he's not part of the panel, but I think we can draw from his expertise as well. Uh, are you with us? Would you like to take one question for us, uh, Dr. Boyd? Sure, Adim, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. So, he's, so Mariano is asking, um, so you, you have new new policies, new legislative, new constitutional provisions, and that obviously requires a harmonization process, uh, an alteration of existing no normative foundations. And, and how does how does that work? And, and what are the challenges uh, that that can create? And how can they be uh, how can they be addressed? Yes, thank you. Obviously, a super important question, and I think there are actually some good examples to draw upon. Um, Mariano's asked two questions, one about harmonization and one, one which he refers to as weaponization, which is an interesting phrase, but uh, I'll take the latter question first. So there are examples of uh, national constitutions where specific types of environmentally damaging activities have been prohibited. And I, I mentioned in, in my remarks the fact that a number of African countries, for example, have specific constitutional provisions prohibiting the import of hazardous wastes into their country. So the there is definitely space in terms of constitutional drafting to come up with specific provisions. Uh, of turning that around, a more positive approach, I would say, is like, uh, for example, the constitution of Bhutan requires that country to retain at least 60% of its land in, for, in forests. So maintaining 60% forest cover for all eternity, which is, you know, a terrific uh, example of something which is environmentally progressive and as... Uh, Professor Sabo would say, protects the rights of future generations. And so that has, that constitutional provision has enabled Bhutan to continue to be, a, from a perspective of climate change, a carbon neutral nation, because those forests are absorbing more carbon dioxide than the society is producing through the combustion of fossil fuels, which is quite remarkable. In terms of harmonization, I think one of the key challenges that countries have faced is that traditionally we have given greater emphasis and priority to economic and social rights than we have to environmental rights, which is how we've gotten ourselves into this terrible global environmental crisis. And so some constitutions are specifically stating that uh, one of the, that they do recognize people's property rights, but those property rights are subject to the overarching public interest in the protection of the environment. So I think it's really important to have those kind of constraints on property rights in order to protect the collective interest in sustainability. And that's 
something what, that we've seen in, in literally dozens of constitutions now is that putting that um, protection in place. So I hope those uh, observations are uh, a beginning of, uh, and I'd be happy to continue that conversation. Th thank, th you. thank you, Dr. Board. I think it's very, you, you bring a very interesting question because often we see social economic rights and environmental rights as complementary. Uh, but there is there is a, a tension, uh, especially if we are pursuing social economic development at, at any cost, and I think that is an imp an interesting point to to investigate further. Uh, so thank thank you very much for for the, for that explanation. And we have Victor, um, kind of he raised a similar question to our our, our friend from 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 Senegal. Um, same, you know, you have uh, provisions in the constitution, um, but the inf enforcement remains a, a big challenge. He says, for instance, for instance, in in Nigeria and some some other places. Um, and I understand that you know we we I have asked uh, Professor Sabo and, and Maria about it. Um, but perhaps I can give you quick, you know, quick one or two minutes. Uh, you know, we've spoken about having in, in, rights in the constitution, having institutions in the constitution, and making sure that they are independent. But we've also spoken about bu constituency building, right? These institutions must anchor themselves in society so that they have a real p political influence. But but what other tips can can you provide? And I'll I'll go back. Perhaps we can start from Maria. If there's any additional points um, that countries like Nigeria where uh, enforcement is, is, is a challenge can, can draw on. And we can go to Professor uh, Kamer Imbote and then and Professor Zabo. Maria, you have the floor. Sure, I think uh, obviously Brazil's uh, case is very particular because there's, a, there's a, uh, an institution that was created by the constitution to ensure that there's enforcement of the environmental laws that we have. Um, I think if, if doing something similar is not an option, definitely ensuring uh, procedural environmental rights is the way to go. So ensuring that there's access to justice, uh, you know, that there's, and, and access to justice it, it means, I think in particular, uh, getting the funding for civil society organizations to bring those cases forward, so which is obviously not a problem in Brazil because we have that institution that is uh, already funded for by the government. So. Um, but yeah, I think that's the access to justice and, and all the ramifications of that is definitely the, the answer here. Th thank you very much. I think we, you know, we spoke about substantive guarantees, we spoke about institutions, and now Maria has brought about an important third aspect, which is, uh, which is the procedural aspect, which access to justice, for instance, uh, guarantees of access to justice, but perhaps of recognition of public interest litigation, uh, and all of that can, can work. But overall, I think civil society in Nigeria, in, in, uh, in Senegal, have a lot of work to do uh, to advocate for, for the constitutionalization of some of these guarantees and also to seek for uh, access to, to justice and other, other access to information as well. Very, very critical uh, for, for these institutions to be able to lead um, uh, um, a successful case in courts and other, other platforms. Professor Kameri, Kameri Bote. Thank you very Any much. Any additional tips for our colleagues yes. from Senegal and Nigeria? I think uh, one of the things that uh, we lose sometimes is over concentrating on the formal institutions. And I think uh, constitutions, uh, many constitutions in Africa now recognize the role of traditional institutions. Uh, so, so for me, I think uh, rather than just look at the institutions that have been created, like in Kenya, the Environment and Land Court, the same constitution actually talks about uh, uh, institutions that uh, deal with land and environment, traditional institutions. And Nigeria, Kenya and other countries have uh, plural legal systems. So we are unlikely to have just one place where you find institutions. So we need to look at uh, different spaces and especially for environment because it occurs at the very local levels. So the principle of subsidiarity uh, would uh, demand that uh, people at the lowest level are involved in decision-making and also the norms and processes at that uh, level as long as they promote sustainable development. Th th thank you very much. I think another important angle, um, you know, we, sh we shouldn't only look at the institutions, but also the process of participation in decision making, 
how do you how do you ensure that people actually participate in decisions that affect the environment and and broadly looking at beyond the core fundamental institutions and looking at this at the systemic level i think that's uh, that, that that is that is critical um and professor professor sabo any additional points here i think it it is very important that uh, or politicians will be interested in what our public is interested in. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, what is our, our public is interested in is often related to what they, uh, what, what they can see in the media, media bubble you know, in which they are all living. And uh, the way how environmental matters can get into the media bubble is often uh, catastrophic scenarios. And uh, that may lead certain people to depression and uh, turning away they had entirely to uh, the matters uh, uh, that are really, really demanding and uh, uh, would need a very urgent uh, and dramatically quick solution. Uh, and uh, I think uh, edu education and, uh, uh, and trying to, and the group and civil organizations role in raising awareness in the society that may on the long term, penetrate uh, into the political thinking. That is the way that can that can have somehow. I think the institutions, as we can know, uh, different institutions can be turned uh, for good purposes. New institutions can be created. Uh, I apologize for all uh, all listeners from Chile because, uh, as I just uh, uh, learned from the remark of uh, David, uh, there is a child ombudsman and there is also a possibility, just to show uh, an example of creativity, to think that uh, the right of the child should not only be protected from a, a, a directly uh, child law uh, perspective, so not only uh, procedural rights in relation in relation and materialized in relation to their parents and uh, to the immediate society that is surrounding them, but also uh, the way of life that it is going to surround them in uh, 50, uh, 60 years uh, and, and a, a very dramatically changed landscape may even require a child ombudsman to, to say something uh, in the, for, uh, for the preservation of uh, natural resources uh, and, uh, and, and trying to help uh, to, to preserve the interest of unborn children, currently unborn children. So I think creativity is, uh, is breaking through at different points in different countries. And I think it's wonderful. All the institutions as well as your institutions can be used, but without a widespread public support and widespread support without uh, very hardworking civil society and civil groups cannot really lead too much for, yeah. for there. You know, I think the, the key point is, is basically we need to build a constituency. We need to build popular media organized pressure on decision makers so that they pay attention. And that in turn, uh, that in turn strengthens the position of, of in entities established to, to promote in, in, environmental rights and in, environmental justice. Uh, very important. We have, I have, um, I see there's, we, are, we have one more minute. So what I'm going to ask Maria, um, you know, th there's a question about the independence of the uh, ministerial, you know, how, how are they set up? How, how does the constitution and in practice, how do these in institutions keep their, their independence? Uh, and in related to that, I think, you know, considering the importance of uh, conflict, do you think their work has actually reduced the risk of conflict in certain areas, uh, particularly, you know, cons considering uh, environmental advocacy and, and, and some of the tensions that, that, that exist in, uh, uh, in, in Brazil? And then final question, we, we might take two, three minutes, but I want to ask uh, Professor Kamerin both about gender, the gender aspect. Um, do you think the, the 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 tribunal, the tribunal in particular, but broadly the environmental mobilization in Kenya, has it in any way advanced or or mainstreamed the, the issue of, of, of gender? Uh, first, Maria, and then Professor Kamerin Bote. Thank you. Um, sure. So the, the independence is guaranteed by having it uh, be separate from the three branches of government. So because the constitution ensures that it's completely separate, they have that functional independent um, and also through the, 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 the funding of it that I mentioned before. So I think that these are sort of the two aspects that make it 
uh, completely independent and, and having no sort of oversight from other branches of government, except their own, obviously there's a, a hierarchy. And, um, and then the, the other question was about conflict, is that it? If, if, if it reduces conflict? Has it reduced the risk of conflict? In particular, when they deal with you know, Amazonia and all, um, you, you know, it, it, may, it may not be, I, I may be imagining it, um, but have they in a way contributed these institutions to reducing the risk of conflict? Yeah, I think it's um, it's a little harder to assess that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I have a perfect answer for it, but I think um, it definitely contributes to ensuring accountability. But uh, I think there's still obviously conflict between, I mean, especially in the Amazon region, since it's so broad, it, it, there's no way that... Um, they could oversee all of the cases and all of the conflicts and all of the illegal uh, acts that are going on within the region. Um, so, you know, it, it has uh, helped to bring accountability to it, but obviously, uh, in, uh, you know, the threats to environmental defenders, for example, which is a huge uh, source of conflict is still a very big issue in Brazil. And, uh, and I think one of the essential roles is actually to bring the people who have, you know, either threatened or, you know, eventually murdered environmental defenders to justice is one of the big roles that the MP could actually um, take on, which it hasn't really done a lot as of yet. No, th th thanks. So they, they are playing a, a role in, in a way, they, they play some kind of deterrence role because of the threat of prosecution of those uh, who, are, who, are, who may be targeting in, environmental advocates. Uh, no, thank you very much. I think it's something we could look into more. Uh, Professor Kameri, I, I hope I didn't put you on the spot as well. Uh, if it's not related, it's okay. But do you think that that gender aspect comes out? And I know we are three minutes ahead, and this will be the last uh, the last question. I promise. Actually, uh, you it, you've not put me on the spot because one of the areas that I've worked on is just looking at the relationship between environment and gender, environmental rights, and uh, rights relating to gender. And I think because constitutions, now I think uh, uh, Dr. Boyd talked about democratization and opening up of spaces. Constitutions now require gender equality, participation of the citizenry. And that includes environmental governance institutions. And of course, even though you're looking at um, a a space where women may not have participated more. Now it's no longer uh, on to say that uh, this is not a women's space. So we are seeing incremental uh, engagement of women. Actually, what I now see needing to be worked on is the engagement of young men and women. Because you see, when we talk about uh, intergenerational equity, these are the people who will we are going to leave the environment to. So if the young men and women are not engaged, then there is a problem for that uh, uh, future uh, uh, rights. Thank you very much. Not just I think the, 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 the emphasis on incremental in relation to women, but also the importance of engaging the youth uh, who are in fact the, the, the you know they, they probably have longer time to live uh, than than the older generation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Kamerin Bote. Thank you very much, Professor Zabo. And thank you very much, uh, Mar Mar Maria Tigre. Um, Kimana, you have, you have the floor. I have the floor, but uh, all I have to say is the same that you just said, which is thank you so much for all of you to making the time to be on this panel. I think uh, we could speak for hours and hours about all of these issues and hopefully this is only the first of, uh, of many upcoming conversations on these issues. Um, so thanks also to all the participants uh, for all their key and super interesting questions. Um, and I have to say thank you also to Adam and to Sharon uh, Hickey, uh, without whom this, uh, this webinar would not have happened. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I hope to see you all very soon again, uh, perhaps for our next Constitutional Design Innovations webinar, but in any case, uh, in, in this continuing conversation of this really critical, critical topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for putting thank this you. together. Thank yeah, you thank very you. much. Uh, enjoy yeah. your day. Enjoy your evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a todos. Okay. Muchas gracias.